This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this may be the fastest gaming laptop of 2021. This is the MSI GE76 Raider, 17.3 inch. For those of you who like it a little smaller, they do have the GE66 Raider, which is a 15.6 inch. So we reviewed the Intel 10th gen version of this several months ago, and again, it's, it was one of the fastest gaming laptops. But with Intel 11th gen Tiger Lake inside and an overclockable Core i9, and an RTX 3080 16 gigabyte with 165 watt TGP. I, you get the idea, this is gonna be fast. How fast? We're gonna find out now. So the Raider has become the top of the line for MSI and also their biggest chassis on board. So we do expect performance here and pricing starts around $2,600 with a Core i7 and RTX 3070 and the 360 Hertz full HD display. There will be an RTX 3060 option that will cost, well, obviously less money. I don't know the pricing yet because it's not out yet. We have the top dog, which has a Core i9 11980HK overclockable CPU inside the RTX 3080, like I said, with 16 gigs of VRAM and that 164 five watt power limit. It's actually, initially they announced it as 155 watt, but they just released a VBIOS right on their website that brings up to 165 watts. I guess they're finding the thermals are just fine enough to allow that. So that's powerful stuff. And our maxed version, which isn't yet shipped in the United States, but actually Intel sent it to us as an example of a showcase really for their top dog laptop Intel Tiger like H45 CPU. This one's gonna cost like $3,400. So we're talking a lot of money here. Obviously it competes with things like the Alienware X17, which is also a pricey piece and also pretty powerful. I do look forward to comparing it to this when we get a hold of that unit too. So the new 11th gen architecture brings some pretty cool things here. Thunderbolt 4, which is nice. More PCIe lanes, which means potentially faster GPUs and also faster SSDs. You can use a PCI 4.0 SSD, which in fact our unit has. I believe Intel put that in. I'm not sure if MSI ships it with that though. Good speeds, that means. Uh, I don't think the SSD speeds mean that much to mere mortals between a fast PCIe and a fast PCIe 4, but hey, it's nice to have, right? And Intel Tiger Lake is particularly interesting because it's their first 10 nanometer CPU. So they're finally starting to catch up with AMD, which means a smaller process is usually more power efficient, means better battery life, means potentially less heat to the chassis, which are good things because we know that Intel's older architecture has been around forever and was not great for battery life and was not great for heat at all. Now this chassis is the same as the one that we looked at several months ago. That was a major redesign, so MS9 is not going to change it again within the same year. And did you know that this is supposed to resemble a spaceship according to MSI? Bit of an angular look, you get the idea. So other than the inclusion now of Thunderbolt 4 instead of just USB-C, you're looking at an identical chassis, identical steel series keyboard, which is a good thing because it's a very nice keyboard. You get the idea. The display options have changed a little bit. The 300 hertz, three millisecond display full HD was the higher end option for the Intel 10th gen one. And now with this one, we have a 360 Hertz still full HD. There is also a 144 Hertz option on the cheaper models. And there seems to be two variants of that according to MSI, one which has pretty much full sRGB and one which has lower. So I, I don't think I would go with that. While we're talking about the displays for a bit, 360 Hertz Full HD is great if you're a highly competitive esports player and you need those really high frame rates, CSGO or whatever it is, right? Uh, for people like me who tend to play more RPGs or Tomb Raider kind of games and all that sort of thing, I would have preferred having a QHD 165 Hertz display because it does look sharper, folks. But I believe there's a shortage of those kind of displays right now. We can only hope. Right now, Asus is the only one who's really rocking that any volume with their Strix SCAR 17 model. Will there be a 4K option like we've seen in the past with MSI? I don't know. We'll find out in the coming months, won't we? The display while we're talking about it. Now, I don't know that this is particular to us reviewers who receive one from Intel and some software got a little munch, but at first the display seemed inordinately 
yeah, measuring below 200 nits, which is obviously not going to happen with this kind of machine. That's not right. So I had to futz with MSI Center, which has replaced Dragon Center. You'll be happy to, he happy to hear because most people really didn't like the outdated Dragon Center software. And switching between DGPU and dedicated graphics mode, and then playing with the MSI True Color. And finally, I got it working right. So if you have a dim display out of the box, futz with the software and get it working. And then maybe disable MSI True Color once you get it where you want it to be so it doesn't get into any more mischief. Huh. So speaking of that switchable graphics, yes, of course we have that here because this is all about performance. I know everybody this year is obsessed by MUX switches or switchable graphics. So this one you'll use MSI Center and you can switch between hybrid switchable graphics mode and DGPU mode only. That does require a reboot. This is not advanced Optimus where you can do it on the fly without a reboot, but it is there for you. In 1080p games and in some games like CSGO, it can make a difference in frame rates, but once you're moving up to QHD resolution, I typically plug it into an LG Ultra Gear QHD gaming monitor, for example, and then and the frame rates are not so different. It also depends on the game. Cyberpunk really doesn't matter as much. But anyway, it's there. You've got that mug switch. Yay, enthusiasts go. The internal architecture is the same as the last generation, which means you have two RAM slots. You can go anywhere from 16 to 64 gigs of DDR4, 3200 megahertz RAM. Ours had pretty good timings. It, it was good RAM. I know that's become an issue in 2021 thanks to RAM shortages. And again, you have two M.2 SSD slots. One is populated typically with a one terabyte NVMe SSD, so you've got another slot available if you wish to add one, and it's the normal 2280 height. We have Killer Wi-Fi 6E on board, which is really an Intel card. We have Killer E3100 Ethernet, 2.5 gigabit Ethernet as well. And ports on this, of course, it's a fairly large chassis. It's going to have plenty of ports. you got three USB-A. You have a Thunderbolt 4 port and a USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 port. Both of those are available. And of course, a headphone jack, HDMI 2.1, yay that, so you can do your 4K at 120 hertz. And mini display port 1.4 and a full-size SD card slot. And the ports, even though it's last same as last gen chassis, let's talk about that, because I really like what they've done here. You have ports along the back and you have ports on the side. Okay, what's so great about that? Well, the ports that should be on the back are on the back, the Thunderbolt port, because most likely you're either going to connect that to a dock, maybe an eGPU, though, given how performant the GPU is here, you probably won't be thinking about that this year anyway. The power connector is in the back, those things that need to get out of the way. And on the sides, we do have USB-A and USB-C ports and the headphone jack accessible, so you don't have to reach around the back for those things you normally have to access. You do have RGB lighting, their mystic lighting bar, they call it now, in the front, and you can program that, and the SteelSeries back lighting is programmable per key RGB as well, so you can have fun with that. The trackpad on this is Microsoft Precision. It's kind of small by today's standards, and it's okay, it's fine. It's not as enjoyable, I find, as what Seuss is putting on their rogue laptops right now, the Republic of Gamers line and the Razer Blade, but it's it's not like the MSI trackpads of old. It's not a horror. It's okay, it's fine. And obviously you do have a number pad on the keyboard, which is pretty normal for a 17-inch laptop. By the way, there is no mechanical keyboard option here. I know that Alienware is starting to do that. We reviewed Seuss Strix scars that have it. So it's your normal quiet membrane keyboard, but it doesn't have that clickety clickety feel for those of you who like that. There's no option for that here in this chassis. Speakers on this, again, same as the immediate previous generation, four speakers. Two are woofers, the others are full range stereo sound, and really good, especially by gaming laptop standards, which for some reason become more pathetic than some of the competing Ultrabooks on the market. I'm not saying 16 inch MacBook Pro necessarily, but it does give the best Asus Rogue Zephyrus six speaker system audio, a run for its money. Plenty loud, has bass, and the Hemic 3 audio, and you can set the parameters for that, your bass, your treble, how much voice clarity comes through for those of you who are playing games and the music is drowning out the voices. You get the idea. It's pretty well done. And you have a 1080p webcam on board, so it's a little less sucky than your average webcam. All right, so what about performance? That's the important stuff here for a gaming laptop, right? Yes, there is an improvement in Intel 11th gen. Yes, we expect it as much. 
And compared to the, the last time we reviewed this CPU in a very thin MSI Z creator chassis, which couldn't really, there was no way it could have the adequate cooling, it's appropriate here. And we're seeing up to 20% improvement compared to Intel 10th gen, looking at the overclockable i9 from that generation. So that's good. They're also up there with AMD Ryzen 9 5900HX, which is a good accomplishment. Hey, Intel, finally. What does that mean? In benchmarks, the numbers are better, duh. What does that mean in terms of thermals? The benchmarks, it runs hot, but oddly in games, it doesn't. Even though it's keeping the clock speeds up high and the GPU is using plenty of watts. So whatever magic they're doing with the balance of dynamic boost and between the CPU and the GPU power and thermals, really well handled in games. And you'll see the gaming, gaming footage running across most of which is a QHD resolution. And you'll see those thermals are nice in games, but when running benchmarks, you can still hit the upper 90 centigrade. Now, one thing I want to note is the unit that we had, the, the GPU was running way too hot, like in the upper 80s, which shouldn't happen, right? So I opened it up and somebody was a little out to lunch when they were putting this together at the factory because the GPU, actually only half of it had thermal paste on it. Well, that would be a problem. And the, the CPU was okay. It was kind of like more around the edges and not so much in the middle. So I just wiped that off. It's conventional paste that they use and put some IC Diamond 7 on there, which is my go-to for laptops. Fills in the spaces really well that laptops have between the heat sink and the CPU. And that fixed the problem there. So quality control these days in 2021, it is what it is among a variety of laptop manufacturers. For all of the benchmarks that you see on screen, by the way, I did not apply any overclock, just left it as it was, since the CPU was a little on the toasty side. Did not undervolt, so it's gonna be just as you get it out of the box and running on MSI's extreme performance setting in MSI Center. In terms of the cooling design inside, it's pretty, at this point I would call it traditional, almost retro, right? We're seeing vapor chambers, we're seeing liquid metal, we're, or whatever fancy name Alienware wants to give basically using liquid metal there. Here we have traditional paste and very traditional heat sink design and tripod heat sinks, which could be a recipe for disaster. But again, the thermals in games are actually excellent. So it works. I won't complain about it. Imagine if they do move on to better cooling, what would happen? But again, like I said, the thermals and the performance and the clock speeds are there. Fine. Cooler Boost is still here. That's an MSI feature. If you want to max your fans out, happily, I didn't find it necessary playing games at QHD on ultra settings. Not needed. I will say, just like with the last generation, uh, the balanced mode is, I wouldn't use that one. I would use the extreme performance mode, or you can do your own manual tuning. You can see on screen what I went with. Basically, I just took the fan curve and upped it a little bit. You know, it, it was too conservative. So adding 10% for the highest temperatures there, and it kept things a bit cooler. So that's gonna make a difference. You can overclock the GPU if you want inside of MSI's center software. If you wanna overclock the CPU, you're gonna to have to do the usual multi-key combo to unlock that in BIOS first, and then you can use Intel XTU or better yet, throttle stop, and you can undervolt. I did undervolt up to negative 80 millivolts, and it did run a little bit cooler, but again, on this unit, it really wasn't so much necessary, but you can do it. So performance is notably better than Intel 10th generation. For those of you who did watch the last gen Raider review and you held off waiting for 11th gen, you can feel good about that now because you do get more performance here and uh, even better thermals in games. But how does it compare to Ryzen? So I've got some graphs for you just so you can see. So this is not the fairest comparison, but with so few models actually available and we receiving fewer review loaner units from manufacturers, we do have the ASUS Rogue Strix SCAR 15. So a little smaller chassis, thermals might be a bit more of an issue. In fact, they sometimes are. And also, MSI has their 165 watt 3080 and our ASUS has 130 watt. 3080, so a little difference there. So the interesting thing to see there is just sort of like in the benchmarks where they're neck and neck now between the Ryzen 9 5900HX and the Core i9 from 11th gen Intel land here. In games, they're pretty similar. In some cases like Valhalla, they got identical scores. And then we look at Tomb Raider and actually the Asus scored a little bit higher on the exact same settings. Interesting, but in Cyberpunk, 
the MSI really pulled ahead. And I think that's the most representative of modern demanding game. It's DirectX 12, it's ray tracing, all of that sort of stuff, which we enabled the LSS on auto. And there was a 10 frame improvement for the MSI. Now, I think there's two reasons. Obviously, it has a more high wattage GPU, right? 165 watts versus 130. And also, it's a less thermally challenged chassis, too. So that makes a difference. So how about battery life? Not the first thing most of us obsess on with a 17.3 inch sort of desktop replacement class gaming laptop, right? Well, it has a 99.9 .9 watt hour battery, just like last generation, which is the highest they can use and still you'd be allowed to take this on an airplane. So obviously they're giving you the most they can there, which is nice. And you have a 280 watt charger, which isn't too bad a carry. That's fine. It's better than some of the 330 watt chargers we've seen of old. I think Intel's more power efficient 11th gen has something to do with not needing as much juice. Anyway, if you put it in switchable graphics mode and only do light work that doesn't trigger using the dedicated graphics, I mean like you're doing Slack and Office and streaming some video, that sort of thing, you could get up to four hours on this if you kept the display brightness to 150 nits, which is what we did in our test. So it's better than the old days when there were only two hours, right? Take off the bottom cover, lots of Phillips head screws, unscrew those, including the one under the factory seal sticker, which MSI says is there so you know nobody's tampered with your laptop, I guess so. Anyway, you can see what the ventilation there is on the bottom. This is what the underside looks like. Pretty easy to take off once you have done those screws, work from the front. And here are the internals, same as the immediate last generation, like I said. And this is why, you know, I always have a soft spot for the Raiders because Look at that, traditional simplicity. No inverted motherboards, no complicated liquid metal to worry about, even though I can be a fan of liquid metal as long as the heat sink has nickel rather instead of copper on it so we don't have chemical mishaps and things going on there. But right here, heat sink, screws, unscrew a couple of fan screws, and you can take this whole thing off, clean it, repaste it, world's your oyster. Other than that, normal looking here, we have side and rear exhaust vents, the fans which are, generally speaking, not too loud, like I said, a little on the high pitch side for a large laptop, but nothing annoying there. And here is our socketed Wi-Fi card, which again is a killer card, Wi-Fi 6E, which is actually an Intel card, hey? And we've got two RAM slots right here, so you can go up to your 64 gigs, easy peasy, that's just fine and normal too, and we have two SSD slots. I have actually put a second SSD in, in there. So NVMe, PCIe 4, if you want those fast speeds, yay. And we have the fairly large woofers on the bottom flanking the 99.99 watt hour battery. So no doubt this will be one of the fastest gaming laptops for 2021. It isn't cheap, it isn't lightweight, but for those of you who want full performance and what's still called the desktop replacement class, though, and you know, this weight, it's really nothing compared to a few years ago when gaming laptops weighed, right? Uh, you've got Thunderbolt 4 on board, besides the fact that you've got very powerful GPUs with high watt limits, you've got that switchable graphics MUX switch going on. A pretty decent display options. I really do hope that we see a QHD option though, because all this horsepower is kind of a waste unless you're an esports player. Uh, the thermals in this when gaming are quite good. Like I said, just look beyond the benchmark thermals, which are kind of on the high side. Overall, given a very traditional architecture, MSI is still managing to excel. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and hit the notification bell so you know about them.